is November 6th, 1928, and in a hospital bed in Manhattan, a man is fighting for his life. He's been shot in the stomach. And despite the best efforts of surgeons at the hospital, his condition is clearly getting worse. His lawyers have gathered at his bedside. You understand this is your last will and testament, Arnold? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I want to make sure Inez is looked after. Carolyn can take care of herself. Okay, it's done. Inez will get one-sixth of the estate for a decade. After that, it reverts to the firm. Yeah, yeah, Inez, the firm. Um, hey, we'll, we'll need some witnesses here, impartial ones. Nurse, can you get one of the others to come over here quick? The dying man is Arnold Rothstein. He's 46 years old and one of the richest men in the city. Two days earlier, New York City police had found him bleeding badly outside the Park Central Hotel. We need you to ask Mr. Rothstein if he understands what he's doing and is of sound and competent mind. So ask him if he understands it's his will, his final will. Okay. Um, Mr. Rothstein, do you understand this is your will? Huh? Whose will is this, Mr. Rothstein? Oh, my will, my will. He's barely able to hold a pen, but he signs the papers. There. It's done. Two police detectives step forward. Mr. Rothstein, we understand you're very sick, but we need to know who did this to you. Rothstein says nothing. Was it Dutch Schultz? Was it Titanic Thompson? Tell us and we'll make sure he serves hard time for what he's done to you. Rothstein looks at the detective. You stick to your trade and I'll stick to mine. Who did it, Mr. Rothstein? Me mother did it. And that was all the cops could get out of him. Rothstein died later that day, taking the name of his killer to the grave. Still, there was no shortage of possible suspects who might have wanted him dead. See, Rothstein wasn't just any old rich guy. He was one of the most famous bootleggers of the 1920s, and one of the most powerful mob leaders in American history. Throughout his career, he was known by several different names. Mr. Big, the man uptown, the big bankroll, and the brain. Before Prohibition, he'd been into gambling, a casino owner, a bookmaker, and a racetrack investor. He had a reputation for fixing sports events and making a lot of money on the outcome. When the Chicago White Sox, the team with the best record in baseball at the time, lost the 1919 World Series to the Cincinnati Reds, it raised suspicions that Rothstein had bribed them to throw the games. Eight White Sox players were eventually banned for life for taking part in the conspiracy which became known as the Black Sox scandal. But it could never be proven that Rothstein was involved. Still, if gambling made his name, it was prohibition that made Rothstein's fortune. By the time he died, he was worth more than $10 million, $140 million at today's value. As prohibition failed to stop people from drinking, bootlegging had become big business. And like Rothstein... Many of the most successful businessmen were gangsters. If you like this podcast, you're probably looking for other great history podcasts to listen to. Wondery, the network behind this show, has other podcasts for you, especially if you love the way we tell stories here on American History Tellers. Great shows like Tides of History and Fall of Rome are fantastic trips back in time that give you a, a visceral feel for what life in those times might have been. And if more modern history is your thing, I'm going to go ahead and recommend my first podcast with Wondery, the political thriller Terms. It's a scripted audio drama, but is it fictional? Just head to apple.co slash Wondery. That's apple.co slash Wondery. Or if you're on an Android, just head to Wondery.fm. From Wondery, this is American History Tellers. Our history, your story. I'm Lindsey Graham. We're continuing American History Tellers with our six-episode series about prohibition. This is part five down and out. In this episode, we'll look at the rise of organized crime in response to the massive demand for alcohol and how the tide started to turn against the national experiment to go dry. By the late 1920s, it was becoming clear to almost everyone that prohibition as it stood wasn't working. 
Americans were still drinking. In fact, now they were drinking as much as before the 18th Amendment was passed. More than any other racket that had come along before, bootlegging, under prohibition, allowed American street gangs to transform into massive, lucrative, organized crime enterprises. To some people, the mob bosses who ran them were heroes, breaking an unjust law to give the people what they wanted. But it came at a cost. Extortion, kidnapping, and murder. What was the fuel that drove it all? Liquor from Canada, which the gangs imported in large quantities. The stream of smuggled whiskey from Canada increased steadily throughout the late 1920s. The province of Ontario had long been a big whiskey producer, until passing its own prohibition in 1916. But after its repeal in 1927, Ontario was back in the liquor business. Canadian distillers were eager to get back to work and start supplying their supposedly dry neighbor to the south. And the fact that it was illegal in the U.S. didn't stop them. As Harry C. Hatch, a Canadian spirits tycoon, famously said, the Volstead Act does not prevent us from exporting at all. It prevents someone from over there from importing. There's a difference. At the outset of Prohibition, most bootleggers had brought alcohol from Canada by water, carried by small boats. If they were stopped, the smugglers would claim that they were headed for Cuba. These supposedly Cuba-bound boats, though, often made several trips per day across the Detroit, Niagara, or St. Lawrence rivers. And then they docked in border towns like Buffalo and Ogdensburg, New York. These towns became important crossings with sophisticated organized crime networks set up to distribute the booze to the rest of the states. Eventually, cars replaced boats as the main way to smuggle booze across the border. Bootleggers used the newly completed Ambassador Bridge and Tunnel that connected Windsor, Ontario with Detroit. Michigan outlawed alcohol a few years before national prohibition went into effect. As a result, the smuggling and bootlegging operations there were already established by 1920, particularly in Detroit where criminal organizations flourished. The most famous of these organizations was led by four brothers, Abe, Joe, Raymond, and Izzy Bernstein. The brothers had grown up in extreme poverty and had started stealing as a way to survive. But over the years, their crimes had gotten bigger, and they gained a reputation for being both fearless and ruthless. Even as youngsters, the brothers were more daring, more outrageous, and more violent than others. They're tainted, bemoaned a shopkeeper recently victimized by the crew. They're not like other kids their age. They's rotten, purple like the color of bad meat. And that's how the Purple Gang got their name. The gang smuggled much of their alcohol from Canada. They would hijack other gangs' trucks and drive them over the frozen ice of the Detroit River to pick up shipments. That earned them another nickname, the Jewish Navy. And the Purples weren't just involved in illegal alcohol. Back in 1924, the gang had also run an extortion ring that targeted the city's dry cleaners and laundry workers. In what became known as the Cleaners and Dryers War, they enforced their shakedown with theft, vandalism, and even stink bombs. In 1925, when the owners of Novelty Cleaners and Empire Cleaners refused to pay up, the Purples dynamited both businesses and murdered their owners. Detroit might not have been called Murder City back then. But with this violence, it was beginning to get a reputation. As big as Detroit was, the real capital of crime was its bigger, wealthier neighbor, Chicago. 1920s Chicago was a huge, rapidly growing metropolis. At its center, poorer European immigrants lived packed together, far from the suburbs and the homes of the city's wealthier residents. After Prohibition went into effect, many of the city's bars had simply taken down their signs, but carried on serving alcohol. But keeping these speakeasies going required a steady supply of booze from Detroit. Most of that contraband was being delivered to one customer, Al Capone. Alphonse Gabriel Capone grew up in Brooklyn, where he ran with several gangs, including the Junior 40 Thieves, the Brooklyn Rippers, and the Five Points Gang. He was known as Scarface, a nickname he got because of a bar fight he got into as a teenager. And the story says a lot about how Capone operated for the rest of his life. When Capone was 18, he had gotten a job as a waiter about a block away from the Coney Island boardwalk at a dive bar dance hall called the Harvard Inn, owned by a local gangster named Frankie Yale. One hot August night in 1917, a young woman named Lena Gallicino was at the bar with her brother Frank. She noticed a man staring at her. Frank, that waiter is staring at me. Can you ask him to stop? She's talking about Capone. 
Frank motions for him to come over, which he does. But before Frank can say anything, Capone is coming on to Lena, loud enough for people at other tables to hear. You got a nice ass, honey, and I, I mean that as a compliment, believe me. Frank is incensed. I won't take that from nobody. Apologize to my sister now, you hear? Come on, buddy, I'm only joking. This is no joke, mister. Capone suddenly turns, his face white with anger. Capone starts moving towards Galuccio. He's bigger, and if there's a fist fight, then Capone wins. But there wasn't going to be a fist fight. In an instant, Galuccio lunges at Capone, slashing at his neck and face with a pocket knife. Capone falls to the floor, blood gushing from three deep cuts. He was lucky to live. The injury was serious, as were the scars. Al Capone hated those scars that gave him the nickname. He usually told people he got them in France during the war, not from a bar fight. As for Frank Galuccio, he was lucky. Others who later tangled with Capone didn't live to tell the tale. In 1919, Capone got into an argument with a member of a rival gang. Unsurprisingly, things got heated, and quickly. Capone beat the man, savagely, leaving just a heap of bleeding flesh behind. When word of the beating got around, the excess of violence brought too much heat for his bosses. For his own protection, and that of his new wife, Capone's superiors sent him to Chicago to work for a gangster named Papa Johnny Torrio. At the time, there were at least a dozen gangs competing for the alcohol business in Chicago. Torrio's organization was one of the largest. They operated out of Chicago's south side and a suburb called Cicero. Torrio's biggest rival was the Irish-run Northside Gang, run by Dean O'Banion. Torrio attempted to avoid all-out turf wars with O'Banion by making concessions on the south side, sharing profits in some of the outfit's activities, including some of its revenues from beer and from its lakefront casino, the ship. But instead of repaying the favor, O'Banion sold him a brewery that was about to get raided by the cops. Torrio was promptly arrested. To the members of his gang, it looked like a setup. Torrio's arrest sparked a bloody gang war that became known as the Chicago Beer Wars. By the time the dust settled, O'Banion was dead, and Torrio, after narrowly surviving an assassination attempt, decided it was time to get out and retire to Italy. Torrio handed the business over to Capone in 1926. By 1928, with Capone at the head, the Chicago outfit was raking in $1 million a year. He was only 29 years old. Al Capone stands out because he was more colorful than almost any mob boss in history. He relished the limelight. He spoke with reporters. He was known for wearing custom suits and flashy jewelry. And he conducted his public affairs with a certain flair. He was also popular because he cultivated an image of himself as a man of the people, a Robin Hood of sorts. He created school milk programs for poor kids and gave generously to charities. Capone didn't deny he was making his money by breaking the law. In fact, he seemed to relish telling people what he was doing. He once said, Nobody wanted prohibition. This town voted six to one against it. Somebody had to throw liquor on that thirst. Why not me? It's 1928, and you're a reporter for the Chicago Herald Examiner. Personally, you like a drink or two after work, but your newspaper is still in favor of prohibition. You're waiting outside the Lexington Hotel on Chicago's South Loop, where Al Capone is staying. Your editor knows that the paper sells when Capone's on the cover, so it's your job to get a quote from him. After waiting around for a while, a car pulls up outside and Capone gets out. He's hard to miss, a big man in a flashy suit with a couple of bodyguards on each side. Mr. Capone, some say you're breaking the highest law of the land, the Constitution. What do you say to that? Who doesn't? The only difference between me and everyone else is that I take more chances than the average man who has a cocktail before dinner and a flock of highballs after him. You're saying everyone breaks the law? Sure they do. But there's a difference between rich and poor people breaking the law. When I sell liquor, they call it bootlegging. When they serve it on silver trays on Lakeshore Drive, they call it hospitality. Capone winks at you and saunters into the hotel lobby, his entourage in tow. Despite his criminality, despite his reputation for violence, you find yourself admitting he's got a point. Capone had a real knack for PR. A brawling gangster in his youth, he had reinvented himself as a charming, roguish, modern anti-hero. To a lot of people in Chicago, he was just a guy making money off an unfair law that nobody wanted in the first place. 
Plus, he was supplying the liquor that kept the city wet and the speakeasies running, which to a lot of people was a good thing. In 1928, Capone was a millionaire many times over, and one of the most powerful and famous men in America. He had been flouting the law for years, not just making a mockery of prohibition, but making a killing off of it. But that fame and power meant nothing when the real force of the law came down on him. It wasn't the Chicago Crime Commission. It wasn't the FBI or the Department of Justice. Al Capone was finally stopped by the IRS. American History Tellers is sponsored by Tripping.com. Most people love to travel, and the few curmudgeons who say they don't really only complain about the hassle of traveling, the expense, just the work involved in planning a few days of not working. Tripping.com can help. If you're looking for the perfect vacation rental and the best deal, don't visit a ton of different sites. On Tripping.com, one search lets you compare every home from the world's top vacation rental sites all in one place. Vacation rentals offer more privacy, more room, and more choices with fully stocked kitchens, extra bedrooms, all the comforts of home, and sometimes even a hot tub. Best of all, at Tripping.com, you can join the millions of travelers who find more savings with rates up to 80% less than traditional hotel rooms. So if you're planning spring break on the beach in Florida, Tripping.com. Can't wait to swim in Lake Tahoe this summer? Tripping.com. Dreaming of sitting on the deck of a Smoky Mountains cabin? Tripping.com. This year, save time and money when you book the vacation home of your dreams with Tripping.com slash Tellers. That's T-R-I-P-P-I-N-G dot com slash Tellers. Find your perfect vacation rental at Tripping.com slash Tellers. American History Tellers is sponsored by Squarespace. American history is largely a tale of gumption. Let's throw this tea into the harbor. Let's take on giant European powers. Let's pitch in and win a world war twice. Just for the hell of it, let's see if we can't go without a drink for 13 years, then decide, nah, we deserve it. We're Americans. If you've got gumption, something you need to do, something you need to say, then you need a website. But websites are tough. How are your coding skills? Got a degree in graphic design? Well, you don't need one. Not with Squarespace. If you need to sell more stuff, reach more people, do more things, Squarespace can help. You'll get beautiful, ready-to-go templates from world-class designers, powerful e-commerce functionality to sell anything, all customizable to your brand, your mission, with just a few clicks. So go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And if you'd like to support American History Tellers and you want to hear more shows like it, then please, when you're ready to launch, use the offer code TELLERS to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com, offer code TELLERS. The events of February 14, 1929, would come to be known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. On that day, Chicago police made a gruesome discovery. Seven men had been gunned down in a warehouse in the Lincoln Park District. Six of them were dead, but one was still alive. His name was Frank Gusenberg. He was an enforcer for the Northside Gang. His brother Peter was also in the warehouse that night, but Peter was dead by the time the police arrived. Frank was shot 14 times, but was somehow still breathing. He was taken to the hospital, and doctors managed to get him stabilized long enough for police to ask him who had shot him. His response? No one shot me. And three hours later, he was dead. Al Capone himself was far away in Florida that night, but that didn't stop the city's newspapers from linking him to the killings. And there were plenty of reasons to suspect Capone and his gang were behind the murders. There was a lot of bad blood between them and the Northside gang, dating back to the Chicago Beer War days. But the police found nothing, and no one, not Capone or any other mobster, was ever tried for the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. For many Chicagoans, the gruesome killings were the final straw. A few months later, a delegation of city bigwigs went to Washington, D.C. to meet with President Hoover to ask him for his help in bringing down Capone. Hoover had come to office as a supporter of Prohibition. He seemed to know that making it work was more complicated than just clamping down on a few bootleggers and gangsters. In his inaugural address in 1929, he said, There would be little traffic in illegal liquor if only criminals patronized it. He'd set up an 11-person panel of judges, law enforcement officials, and academics. 
The Wickersham Committee, as it became known, was tasked with studying prohibition and non-compliance and making recommendations on how to improve it. But what he heard from the Chicago group stirred Hoover to action. He would later write about the visit in his memoirs. He said the group told him that, quote, Chicago was in the hands of the gangsters, that the police and magistrates were completely under their control, that the governor of the state was futile, and the federal government was the only force by which the city's ability to govern itself could be restored. The president was outraged that a major city was being run by the mob. He agreed to help and asked the attorney general to put together a task force to catch Capone. After that, Hoover met every day with his top advisors, including Andrew Mellon, Secretary of the Treasury Department, which had oversight of the Bureau of Prohibition. Each meeting began with Hoover asking the same question. Have you got that fellow Al Capone yet? One man trying hard to answer that for Hoover was Chicago's crime commissioner, Frank Lash. At this point, Lash was nearly 80 years old, with a long career in Chicago, and had built a reputation as a straight-talking lawman. He believed that to bring down Al Capone the man, he would first have to bring down Al Capone the myth. To do that, he went after the mobster in the court of public opinion, taking every chance he got to publicly criticize him as a dangerous criminal. Lash's own views on crime were muddled by a strong anti-immigrant prejudice. He once claimed that real Americans weren't gangsters. The crime wave stemmed from immigrants with, in his words, the Jews furnishing the brains and the Italians supplying the brawn. In 1930, Lash began publishing a list of hunted criminals, and Capone was at the top, public enemy number one. One of the reasons the Bureau of Prohibition was having such little success in clamping down on the liquor trade was rampant corruption in law enforcement. To deal with this, the Bureau decided it needed to bring in the cleanest cops they could find. And among this new wave was Elliot Ness, a young Bureau agent from Chicago. Ness personally selected a team of nine men that he thought were above reproach and immune to the temptations of bribery or blackmail. When Al Capone unsuccessfully attempted to bribe members of his team with a sum close to the agent's annual salary, Ness held a press conference to share the news of the incident. The Chicago press gave them their new name, the Untouchables. But while Ness and his colleagues gained a lot of press and acclaim for pursuing the mob kingpin through raids on stills and small charges like contempt of court, the lesser-known law enforcement professionals who actually led to Capone's demise were Assistant U.S. Attorney Mabel Willebrandt and Chicago U.S. Attorney George Johnson. It was Willebrandt who became known as the First Lady of Law who came up with the idea to go after Capone not for bootlegging, but for tax evasion. Because in 1927, the Supreme Court had ruled that the Treasury Department could demand income tax from bootleggers. Even though the income was earned through illegal activities, that was no reason the government couldn't still tax it. With patient and diligent legal work, the government began building a solid tax evasion case against Capone. One of the biggest pieces of evidence came from his own lawyers. His defense team had been trying to negotiate with the Internal Revenue Service. Crucially, the lawyers admitted that Capone had not declared at least $100,000 per year in income. It amounted to a confession of guilt. They had it on paper that he'd failed to pay tax on the money he'd made. In October 1931, Capone was sentenced to 11 years in prison for tax evasion. He was furious. He raged that he'd never heard of anyone getting more than five years for tax evasion and that he was being punished for something else entirely. He wasn't wrong about that. American History Tellers is sponsored by ZipRecruiter. Imagine that it's May 1927. Under the mist of Niagara Falls, you and your new bride just toasted to a long and happy life ahead with real champagne. The waiter brings it whenever you want. It's incredible. You can't find this stuff back home. Nothing this affordable, this quality. I've heard stories from friends in the States. They say even if you can find a drink, the quality is almost always poor. Sounds like my bakery. I can't seem to find reliable help. It's just me and my pop. He's stuck there for two weeks all alone while we're here. I feel bad, but good help is really hard to find. A lot has changed since Prohibition, but good help can still be hard to find. Every business needs great people and a better way to find them. Something better than posting your job and just praying for the right people to see it. That's why ZipRecruiter built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. You can even try ZipRecruiter right now for free at ZipRecruiter.com A-H-T. That's ZipRecruiter.com A-H-T. 
Cheers. By 1929, alcohol consumption in the United States had almost rebounded to pre-prohibition levels. And even those who had access to safe alcohol were developing unsafe drinking habits, like drinking in unregulated establishments and binge drinking. Unsure of when they might next have a chance to drink alcohol, people were drinking a lot all at once. And it was a public health nightmare. And with crime on the rise, too, public opinion was turning against prohibition. But Congress? Congress was still all in. In May 1929, the Republican-controlled Congress was still committed to shoring up prohibition. It passed the Jones-Stalker Bill, which turned violations of the Volstead Act into felonies, punishable by up to five years in prison and $10,000 penalties, almost $150,000 in today's money. Prohibition's critics pointed out that this would disproportionately affect poor people, who'd be hauled in and charged with low-level alcohol sales. One U.S. attorney objected that the criminal justice system was already full of a seething mass of bartenders, peddlers, and waiters. And even some moderate Republicans thought this tough-on-crime approach went too far. Republican National Committee woman Pauline Sabin had been a supporter of Prohibition when it first came into effect. She once said that she believed a world without liquor would be a beautiful world. Now, though, She was concerned that the next generation was growing up with a total lack of respect for the law. The young see the law broken at home and upon the street. Can we expect them to be lawful? Sabin had come to the conclusion that prohibition was unenforceable. She founded the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform in Chicago, rallying the support of society ladies and moderate Republicans. Her campaign was featured in The New Yorker, Vogue, and on the cover of Time magazine. After 10 years of poisoning deaths, vigilante raiders, street violence, and an increasing disrespect for the law, people were ready for change. Even those who originally supported prohibition were coming out in favor of reform, even full repeal. The influential Hearst newspaper chain offered a cash prize for the essay presenting the best solution to the problems posed by prohibition. Out of 70,000 submissions, the paper's editors chose an essay written by Judge Franklin Chase Hoyt of New York entitled The Effect of Prohibition in Juvenile Court Work, in which he argued for the legalization of beer and wine. The essay competition signaled a massive change in editorial policy for the paper. Up until then, all William Hearst newspapers had supported prohibition. But a decade in, Hearst suddenly decided it had been a failure that created, in his words, criminal conditions. Hearst's pivot and how it affected the view of prohibition in the pages of his newspapers was a turning point in public opinion. And it wasn't just the newspapers changing their tune. There were plays depicting drinking and gambling in a more positive light, not to mention the booze-soaked novels of F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway. Even the motion picture industry, which had started out with temperance dramas and reenactments of anti-alcohol plays, were now crossing over to the wet side. A couple of telling examples were Our Dancing Daughters and Our Modern Maidens, two silent films from the late 1920s that feature young women enjoying a night out. Unlike the films that Hollywood had been churning out before, these didn't end with a commentary on the evils of alcohol. Tinseltown had turned against temperance. Even legendary Georgia fiddler Low Stokes knew the score. He put it bluntly. Prohibition is a failure most anyone can see For whiskey sold in every town in the good old USA Oh, the policeman will arrest you He'll lock you up in jail He'll drink up all your liquor And turn you out on bail But supporters of Prohibition didn't take this renewed campaign for reform lying down. Audiences in 1929 might have seen newsreels of evangelical preacher Billy Sunday speaking in Boston titled, Billy Sunday Burns Up the Backsliding World. Civilization and society rests on morals. Morals rest on religion. Religion rests on the Bible and faith in God and in Jesus Christ. America needs a tidal wave of the old-time religion. America needs to be taken down to God's bathhouse and the hose turned on her. And I want to take a pledge in this audience to join me in a pledge that you will never rest until this old God-hating, Christ-hating, whiskey-soaked, Sabbath-breaking, blaspheming, infidel, bootlegging old world is bound to the cross of Jesus Christ by the golden chains of love. 
the temperance groups which had put such effort into passing the 18th Amendment found themselves now campaigning just as hard against repeal. Ella Boole, the president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, started directly lobbying politicians and endorsing dry candidates. She made regular appearances on the radio, and she accused politicians of hypocrisy and double-dealing. But then, in late 1929, America went over a cliff. The Wall Street panic, in my opinion, it had to come. Stock speculation had become crazy. On Monday, October 29, 1929, the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 13% of its value. The following day, it did not recover. Instead, it lost an additional 12%, earning it the name Black Tuesday. The incredible gains in the stock market over the previous decade had fooled many into a false sense of security. Average middle-class investors who hadn't been able to resist the lure of fast money had poured their savings into stocks and shares. They were encouraged by economists who predicted that the stock market's high value was the new normal. The foundations of that prosperity, however, weren't as solid as they looked. Middle-class Americans had borrowed heavily to pay things for like new homes and cars. While the economy was growing, that debt wasn't very important. But when the economy started to slow down, more and more Americans found themselves unable to pay back the money they owed. The stock market crash brought the whole house of cards tumbling down. About $25 billion was lost in the crash, translating into about $350 billion in today's dollars. Wealthy investors suddenly found themselves penniless. Bankrupt stockbrokers threw themselves off buildings on Wall Street. But it was the middle and working classes who suffered the most. Imagine it's 1930. It's summertime, more than six months after the crash. Wall Street might be on the other side of the country, but the effects of the crash are plain to see all around you in San Francisco. The company you were working for went bust earlier in the year, and you've been out of work ever since. Now, you're behind on your rent, getting desperate. You spent the day walking around the city, asking if anyone is hiring, and no one is. To clear your head, you decide to take a walk along the bay. You're not the only one out for a walk, even though it's the middle of a weekday. You see people feeding the seagulls or just staring out at the ships. Unemployment in San Francisco is not as high as the 9% national figure you read in the Chronicle, but is getting pretty bad here. You stop to admire the line of luxury yachts tied up along the waterfront. Big, sleek, modern boats. Must be nice, you think. You notice a glamorous young woman sitting on a bench watching you. She looks like she could have been in the movies. Want to buy one? She's grinning. You play along. Which one? Are you kidding? They're all for sale. All of them? That's right. Owners paid half a million dollars for them years back. Don't have much use for them now that everything went to hell. Now you take a closer look at the boats. There are barnacles on the sides and the decks are going green for lack of cleaning. Matter of fact, I just sold two of them. I think it was a rum runner. Guess how much he paid? How much? 10,000 bucks. And you just know he's going to rip out all that nice stuff from inside so he can fill her up with drink. I got my commission, though. That woman standing on the docks is Sally Rand, the famous burlesque dancer. In a few years, she'll make a huge name for herself performing at the Chicago World Fair. Her provocative dances, in which she hides her naked body using only ostrich feathers or balloons, will also see her fall foul of laws against indecent exposure more than once. But on this day, she's earning a 10% commission selling the boats of bankrupt tycoons to bootleggers. Rightly or wrongly, President Hoover was the man everyone blamed for the Great Depression. Hoover's name became synonymous with economic hardship, and the country's many shanty towns, ramshackle huts and tents for the homeless, were all renamed Hooverville. Hoover's response to the economic crisis was further protectionism. He deported unemployed Mexican workers with a Repatriation Act and tried to close all borders to trade. With his backing, Congress passed the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act in 1930, raising or placing tariffs on some 20,000 imports. But it wasn't enough to save the economy or the politicians. For dozens of Republican congressmen, that was the last legislation of their careers. In the 1930 midterm elections, the Republicans were hammered, losing 52 seats to the Democrats. The number one issue was the economy, of course, but Republicans were also badly hurt by a five-part 
tell-all story about the secret drinking habits of the nation's congressmen. Splashed across the front page of the Washington Post right before voters went to the polls, George Cassidy, a D.C. area bootlegger, decided to blow the lid off of Capitol Hill hypocrisy on his way out. For nearly 10 years, I have been supplying liquor at the order of the United States senators and representatives at their offices. Cassidy's piece began, On Capitol Hill, I am known as the man in the green hat. The expose was payback for arrests and raids he had endured over the previous 12 months. His story outlined how he had dealt in large quantities of alcohol, selling it to prominent, supposedly dry politicians who bought directly from him, sometimes as early as nine in the morning. To many, the hypocrisy was astounding. With a little help from the man in the green hat, the Democrats did well in a number of races, winning eight Senate seats and a sweep of the New York state elections. The mood in the country was turning, and quickly. But the federal government wasn't about to change direction just yet. January 1931 saw the publication of the Wickersham Committee's report, the committee set up by Hoover to look into prohibition. The committee conceded that the so-called noble experiment was a disaster, but their solution was just to enforce the law more rigorously. The columnists from the New York World summed up the Wickersham report. Prohibition is an awful flop. We like it. It can't stop what it's meant to stop. We like it. It's left a trail of graft and slime. It don't prohibit worth a dime. It's filled our land with vice and crime. Nevertheless, we're for it. On August 11, 1932, President Hoover accepted his party's nomination to run for a second term. His speech to the Republican National Convention reaffirmed his commitment to prohibition. The repeal of prohibition would mean the return of the saloon. And with it, what Hoover said was its corruption its moral and social abuse which debauched the home. The choice was clear. Four more years of Hoover meant four more years of prohibition. But the president was swimming against the tide. What Hoover had called the noble experiment was looking more and more like a not-so-noble disaster. Next time on American History Tellers. The voices of those calling for an end to prohibition become impossible to ignore. But to bring back beer, they're going to have to do something that has never been done before. Repeal a constitutional amendment. I hope you enjoyed our fifth episode of Prohibition. If you did, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, NPR One, and every major listening app, as well as Wondery.com. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes, including some details you might have missed. You'll also find some offers from our sponsors. Please support this show by supporting them. And thank you. American History Tellers is hosted, sound designed, and edited by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Additional production assistance from Derek Behrens. This episode is written by Christine Sismondo, PhD, and produced by George Lavin. Executive producers Marshall Louie and Hernan Lopez for Wondering. American History Tellers is sponsored by ZipRecruiter. Cheers! Happy anniversary, man, and congrats on keeping the bakery going. It takes a ton of work to run a small business, and you're not just doing that, you're still building it. First quarter revenue is already up from 2017. You should be really proud. I had no idea that Great Grandpa's Bakery would turn into, well, into this. When he started it, it was just him and his dad. And now it's 100 years old. I'm just so happy you joined the team. I feel like I can finally take a vacation without worrying. Although I think it's probably time we hired someone to help you. We're growing faster than we can keep up. Hey, that would be great. Then then I can take a vacation. I'll go through ZipRecruiter again. It was the smartest decision I've made in this business. Every business needs great people and a better way to find them. Something better than posting your job online and just praying for the right people to see it. Today, there is a better way. ZipRecruiter knows that good help is hard to find, so they built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. That's why 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And they even spotlight the strongest applications you receive, so you never miss a great match. It's revolutionized how you find your next hire. Businesses of all sizes trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. You can try ZipRecruiter right now for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash A-H-T. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash A-H-T. One more time, ZipRecruiter.com slash A-H-T. ZipRecruiter. 
the smartest way to hire. 